should I? So good morning, good afternoon. Thank you for <laughs> being here. I, I just, uh, as you know, I just uh, briefed the Security Council. I think it was a session that you could have access to. Sorry, I'm not an expert of these details, but so you've heard me, and I think this is a, this is a, a bit of an institutional moment. I'm invited usually once a year. Sorry? What is that? Some people are having a hard time hearing. So I, I, do you hear me now? Okay. So I just, just telling this is a, an institutional briefing. I come once a year and invited to make a comprehensive presentation, if you wish, of the global refugee situation. So this was the case under the presidency of Ghana. So as you heard, I spoke about uh, the the global situation of forced displacement, of course, the proliferation of conflict, the lack of political solutions, for which the Security Council is also responsible, has meant that we have now reached the terrible uh, uh, milestone, if you wish to call it like this, of 103 million refugees and displaced. Of course, Ukraine, the crisis in Ukraine has contributed to the swelling of this figure with more than six million displaced inside the country and several million refugees in other countries. But uh, I also reminded that there is not only Ukraine, that uh, it is important to pay equal attention to all other humanitarian and refugee crises around the world. And I mentioned as an example a few of them in Ethiopia, in uh, Myanmar, uh, in the Sahel, in the Horn of Af in general in the Horn of Africa, um, and, uh, um, and in many other places. I have stressed this time, I've given a bit of space to uh, giving our point of view on the link between climate change, the climate emergency, conflict, and displacement. Sometimes this is seen a little bit simplistic, or oh, climate change displaces people, yes, but it's more complex than that, and it, it, it happens in different ways in different parts of the world. Very often, the displacement caused by climate is through conflict because climate change generates conflict between communities and this in turn generates uh, displacement. We see it very, very clearly in the Sahel, for example, but in other places as well. And then I made some ask, I told the Security Council, although this is not their job as the Council, but through them I made an appeal to all countries to support financially, not to diminish, not to decrease, both humanitarian and development assistance, there is a real risk that with donor budget shrinking because of COVID-19, because of uh, the, the, the response to the Ukraine crisis uh, and other factors that uh, the, the cost of living and so forth, the risk is that uh, we will have to make cuts, first of all, in humanitarian programs around the world. This will create, will create suffering, but also push back even further solutions to these problems. But I also told everybody that development assistance needs to continue. I went to Somalia last week. I saw it very clearly. It's not just about giving people food and medicines and shelter. It's also about making people more immune, more protected from the chronic shocks of climate and conflict. The situation in Somalia is very clear from that uh, point of view. I also flagged to the Council that increasingly in this very difficult geopolitical context, organizations like mine, we have people on all the front lines they're talking about, and we find ourselves in very difficult circumstances, working in uh, territories or countries controlled by armed groups sometimes, we find ourselves in countries that are under sanctions or that, uh, uh, or in very polarized refugee situations. And I told them that humanitarian assistance has to be delivered to people in need wherever they need it, irrespective of these circumstances. And if this means that we have to operate in countries, for example, under sanctions, that what is called here in the Security Council carve-outs, exemptions 
to sanctions for humanitarian assistance have to be better regulated. The Council is discussing this, is in the process of reflecting on this, and I encourage them to come to some early conclusion because it's uh, very important for us to, 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 to see that. And finally, I told them that, because the question came up, in their intervention, what can we do? You know, what can you do is be more united, at least when you discuss humanitarian space, humanitarian uh, assistance, so that uh, uh, you know, political division does, do not increase further the suffering of the people that are already victims of war or persecution and discrimination. So in a nutshell, uh, this was the gist of my briefing. And uh, if you want to ask me any questions, I'm here. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, Commissioner. This is Petra Nuruk with the Turkish News Agency. As you're aware, Turkey is building uh, houses in uh, northern Syria to relocate a million Syrian refugees. And I was wondering, since this announcement, if the UNHCR has been in touch with the Turkish authorities, if they're supporting this project, and if uh, you, UNHCR, is ready to cooperate with Turkey on this project. Thanks. The, the, the response to this uh, uh, question is always the same. UNHCR will always encourage support to refugees that decide to return voluntarily, usually ideally to their places of origin, and, uh, 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 but provided that this choice is voluntary. So provided this choice of voluntary, then we need to look at the circumstances and, 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 and help people return wherever they come from in Syria. It's not just uh, those areas that you've mentioned. People, refugees from Syria, there's about almost six million, almost four are in Turkey. So of course, uh, you know, some of them may want to return, not many at the moment. So we need to help them if they want to return. However, let me stress this. Very few people for the time being are returning to Syria. Very few people, you see the statistics. And uh, what we need to do, and this came up also in the discussion in the Security Council, is that we need to remove the obstacles. Why are they not going back? Some obstacles are material. Yes, they need shelter or work or education, but some other obstacles are more fear, linked to security, linked to some legal issues. And we're working with all concerned, including the government of Syria. I visit Syria regularly every year. I did it just recently, and we continue that discussion. Thank you very much, Mr. Grande. Edith Lettera from the Associated Press. Nice to see you. Um, you said that um, UNHCR is doing some um, forward planning um, on the Ukraine crisis because you believe it's going to be protracted. Uh, what are your fears of uh, how many more people could be displaced since it's 14 million already? And how much more money does uh, UNHCR need this year and for next year? Well, um, <laughs> these are, it's difficult to give you precise figures, but yes to your first question, we are actually to be more specific, we have never stopped doing contingency planning because this conflict has, um, has evolved in the course of the last, what, nine months, um, has actually become more harsh in recent weeks, for example, with strikes on civilian infrastructure and urban centers. This is likely to cause more displacement, as you can well imagine. So we are trying to follow the evolution, like unfortunately always in conflict, the evolution of the conflict and to plan accordingly. In, for two types of movements, if you wish, internal displacement, which I think is more likely to happen at this juncture, and there we work closely with the government of Ukraine. They are the ones leading the planning and we support and mobilize resources and deploy our teams on the ground. And then we work also for the possibility, which I think at the moment is less likely, of further flows outside Ukraine. That, as you remember, was the beginning of the crisis when people were really worried and uh, 
especially women and children, uh, uh, were put in safety. Nobody knew how the conflict would evolve. Were put in safety in, in countries in Europe and elsewhere. So figures are difficult. They are very variable. But uh, uh, And also, to uh, give you a sense, uh, UNHCR alone, and remember, we are one of the organizations. We and our partners have a budget of about a billion dollars for this year, for this year in Ukraine. I can hardly see how we will need less next year, given that, unfortunately, I think the crisis will continue. At the moment, the big, sorry that I'm using a question to give more details, at the moment, the big effort is around winter. And this is what the government of Ukraine has also told all of us. Let's focus really very uh, um, strongly on preparing for winter, which means many things. Means mean fixing uh, public buildings where homeless people or people deprived of shelter can find shelter. Means distributing uh, anything that protects from uh, the cold. Um, uh, means intensifying cash distribution, which are very vital because they give people flexibility to buy what they need, etc., etc. But it is very worrying. And as I said, you know, the needs are escalating so quickly that, frankly, sometimes it's like fighting against the windmill. You advance, you make progress, and then another strike happens, another uh, thousands of people are displaced, and it's very, very harsh and very difficult. And the winter there is the harsh, one of the harshest I've seen personally. Hi, my name is Ibtisam Azim from the Daily Arabic Al Arabi Al Jadid newspaper. So I have first a follow up on the Turkish Syrian um, um, refugee and the, the Syrian refugees in Turkey. And uh, my follow up was: Do you have, from your reports or from your people who work on the ground, do you have the feeling that the Turkish authorities are putting some pressure on Syrian refugees to uh, go back to Syria? And my question is uh, about uh, Libya and the problems uh, there. Um, first, the first part about the European countries, the role you think they should play and they are not playing, sending back refugees despite the fact they know that uh, they could uh, face human trafficking, etc. And are you a little bit more optimistic that you could get a little bit more on this issue, having a new uh, UN envoy uh, there in Libya? Thank you. Okay, that's a lot of questions in one. <laughs> uh, on the on the first, you know, on the first question, let's let's um, say this. You know, we have um, the first the first Syrian refugees fled in 2011, so it's 11, almost 12 years ago. So in the course of this long time, there have been at times with everywhere instances where maybe people were not accepted or uh, sent back. I have to say, in respect of Turkey, we have always raised this issue. Whenever we know, this is the agreement. We raised it with them, and we try to address this issue. Our relation with Turkey is very good in that respect, and we'll continue to adopt this procedure. A frank discussion, if these things happen, sometimes they happen locally, and they need to be avoided, of course, uh, but uh, uh, the, the relationship in that respect is constructive. Regarding Libya, of course, I'm concerned. I hope, you know, I can't speak for my political colleagues, I hope that there will be renewed momentum towards finding a solution to this conflict. From our perspective, from the perspective of my organization, you know, we work very closely with IOM also. From the perspective of the organization dealing with the movement of people, peace is important also because without peace, especially when the situation is insecure, we can have less access to all those people that are at risk of exploitation, discrimination, and trafficking. You know very well. I think we made progress in past years in taking those people outside those detention centers. Um, IOM has been working on repatriating those that decide to go back, mostly migrants. Uh, they, uh, they, they decide to go back to their country, then the tens of thousands have gone back. UNHCR has taken care of those that cannot go back because they're refugees. They come from conflict areas, for example. And uh, those, we try to help them in Libya, sometimes difficult because of the situation, but we also have ways to extract them. 
we have a program, uh, you know, programs to extract them, to resettle them to third countries. Uh, when insecurity increases, this becomes more difficult. And this is when you see also more people trying to being trafficked or trying to go on boats across the Mediterranean, which is very dangerous. And the, the, your other question is, you know very well our position. Nobody should be returned to Libya or to places where people can be at risk. But we also recognize that we need to look at the causes. Why are people leaving Libya and address them and continue to address them? Um, Stefano Vaccara, La Voce di New York. Eh, benvenuto sempre qui al Palazzo di Vetro, un piacere ascoltarla e vederla. Um, you just say that the Security Council and also before uh, the General Assembly that you, you complimented Europe for receiving so many refugees um, from Ukraine. But I noticed that I think in your comment you had a kind of, uh, you kind of also said this is show that Europe is not such a big problem. I mean, it could have received so many, I mean, this, this wave of refugee. Uh, my question is, why Europe was so good to receive refugees where they're coming from Ukraine, and we are all happy about it, but instead it was, uh, was a, such a problem to receive refugees who are coming from other side, that this is just a follow-up to my colleague question just today, Italy renew the so-called memorandum with Libya, and is a follow-up of what you just said before. This, uh, do, I mean, what is your comment on okay. the fact that Maybe they I renew something like this? this? The question. First of all, I never said that it's not a big problem. I never said, you know, large numbers of refugees going somewhere is always a problem. So I never said that. I said that it's a problem that in respect of the Ukrainian outflow, Europe has dealt with very well, proving the point that when there is will, political will, and unity, because it was done in a very shared manner, it is possible to do it, which is what we have been saying for years. If you work together, if you find solutions together on burden sharing, if you, by the way, you know, the Ukrainian refugees were given access to services, uh, were given freedom of movement across the Schengen space, so they could go to places where they had communities. So this was very facilitated. And rather than becoming more of a burden, it unburdened governments from some of their responsibilities. So it's a good model, which I hope can be used. I'm, I'm a positive person. I don't say blame for what hasn't happened. Let's say it has happened, so why don't we try it? We take not every, out, not every movement is the same, we have to admit that, but can we take some lessons from what we have learned through this? And, you know, Europe is still going through a complicated discussion on a European pact on migration and asylum promoted by the European Commission. Uh, it was in, in Ursula von der Leyen State of the Union speech in September. She spoke about that and she made that uh, comparison. She said, we've learned a lot with the Ukrainian influx, can we do the same? So that's the direction to go. Why this happens? I think that I look at it in this way. Uh, Ukraine was very close, a war in Europe, public opinion very sympathetic, very understanding, the close link between bombs and flight, right? So I think it was, there were many more um, facilitations to handling this thing in a certain way. The point that I have always made in every country in Europe is the fact that some flows of people are easier to deal with than other flows does not mean that we should not deal with all of them in the same way, if you see what I mean. In some cases it will be more complicated and more difficult to promote integration, etc., etc. But it doesn't exempt us from having the same obligation to all people that that knock at the door. And uh, uh, in Libya, you know, just to add to this point, I've said it so many times. You know, there is nothing wrong with strengthening one institution or the other of the Libyan state. The Coast Guard is a necessary institution of the Libyan state. My point is that if you only build the Coast Guard and you don't build all the other institutions, then there is an imbalance because you risk having people that are, that are brought back into Libya and then they cannot benefit from good rule of law or other institutions. So there has to be a balanced approach. 
I think she wants to speak. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Linda Fasulo, NPRUN. My question has to do with climate change. <clears throat> Excuse me. You mentioned that climate change is one of the factors contributing to the flight of people from their countries. I was just wondering how significant is climate change as being a key factor in some of the uh, flight? And, other, and also, can you name a few countries where climate change has been a top or the top factor in the flight of refugees. You see, people always want me to give figures, say, oh, you know, because some people have given figures. Oh, by 2050, there will be half a billion people moved by climate change. I'm not going to do that because it's impossible. The relationship is not, it's difficult to explain, but it's not automatic. Climate change has many phenomena, right? Extreme weather uh, episodes, those maybe displace people, but maybe they displace people for a week and then they go back. What is of concern to an organization like mine is when climate change interlinks with conflict, essentially. And almost always in this very fragile setting, you asked me to give examples, Somalia, for example, the Sahel countries, this is very typical. Then you have this link, you know, you have the climate change, what does climate change do? It dries up a lake or a water resource. So the communities living there start fighting. That is what displaces them, if you see what I mean. Then there is another link that I made at the Security Council. In Somalia, for example, drought. I've seen it with my eyes last week. Big displacement, that is due to drought. People have no more, uh, nothing to do. They have to go where they can receive assistance. But conflict, which is also happening at the same time, Al-Shabaab, insurgency, prevents us from bringing assistance to the villages that have affected by drought. So people move to go to another village that is in a safer area. Sometimes they move across border, they become refugees. They go to Kenya, they go to Ethiopia. So it's very complicated to give figures to this diverse phenomena. And one has to understand that it's much more complicated than, oh, there is this big thing called climate change. It's coming and everybody will flee. It doesn't work like that. Gracias. Celia Mendoza, Voice of America for Latin America. Can you tell us what are the challenges that you see um, in the past few months in Latin America? We have seen an increase of migrants coming not only from Venezuela, but also Nicaragua and Haiti. And um, what are also the challenges for your office, specifically in the Mexico-US border with the increase of people being returned and um, the work that you might be doing with Mexico? And the second part of my question is, I know that you guys had made a plea for a funds. How dire is the situation in terms of funds before the end of the year as your agency is struggling with that? Well, in the Americas, you know very well, because you, we've spoken many times about it, uh, that uh, the, the big challenges are, well, we still have uh, a larger, large population of Venezuelans, refugees and migrants. This is a very specific group. We're working with, you know, some countries have done fantastic work like Colombia, Ecuador, Dominican Republic in regularizing these people. Um, and, um, but we're now also increasingly talking to Venezuela to see what needs to be done, so because maybe some people want to return, or what needs to be done to create conditions again for people to go back to their country. So that continues. We have the cluster of problems around the northern part of Central America, Honduras, Guatemala, and Salvador. That is displacement often due to the action of criminal gangs and uh, non-state actors. Um, and very, very significant link with poverty very often. Uh, and sometimes even climate change has, has played an, a role even in that region. We have the situation in Nicaragua, which unfortunately has produced significant displacement, especially into Costa Rica. And now, uh, recently, we have seen also a spike of movement of Haitians. Now, some Haitians do not come from Haiti directly. They have been many years in Brazil, in Chile, in other countries, and this is a more of an economic nature. But also, you know, our advice is that people should not be returned to Haiti at this particular moment with the fragility of the country. Uh, we've all been following, and Security Council, you know, this came up in the conversation because they're also following. And uh, uh, the situation at the U.S. border is, uh, 
you know, I've said it many times, we remain available to, and in fact, we continue to discuss with the US administration on how to improve the management of these enormous flows that have impacted that border and how to uh, help the US government clear the backlog of asylum claims that has built hundreds of thousands over the years, probably the biggest backlog in the world in that respect. Uh, you know, there are some restrictions for some groups uh, linked to, it was originally linked to COVID-19, the famous Title 42. That we have always um, uh, disagreed with. We don't think, we, especially now that the pandemic is more, not completely finished, but more under control. But we continue to discuss. Uh, recently, as you know, uh, some proposals or some decisions were made by the US administration on also safe channels for Venezuela. So we're discussing all these issues. It's a very complex, but once again, the discussion is quite constructive with Mexico, with uh, uh, the US and other countries. Last point I want to make, you know, I was very happy to, in June, I think it was in June, to be at, uh, well, you were there as well, to be at the Los Angeles uh, uh, Cumbre de las Americas, la Summit of the Americas. Because I think that the declaration that was made by all states in the region on population movement was a very positive one, which we supported very strongly. It needs to be implemented, working together to try to address these complicated flows. I know we have two more questions, and I think we'll have to wrap it up. So we can start here, sir, and then over to you. Uh, hello, Mr. Um, uh, Hi, Commissioner. My name is Kursi Abari, Asia Times correspondent in Iran. So my question is uh, on the ongoing crisis in Iran. The country has been uh, rocked by nationwide protests for the past seven weeks, and uh, still a large community of two to three million Afghan refugees live in the country. And uh, so many Afghans continue to cross the border into Iran, uh, fleeing persecution at the hands of the Taliban. Are you concerned that the long-term uh, lack of security, democratic backsliding, and um, uh, the overall situation in Iran that is deteriorating uh, swiftly will have a negative impact on the well-being and safety of these Afghan refugees and will trigger a crisis that you might have to deal with. Well, what can I say? You know, I, of course, Iran has been an important interlocutor for the government of the Islamic Republic, has been a very important interlocutor for UNHCR for decades. Iran has hosted Afghan refugees since the beginning for 40 plus years. And Mayad has been a good host to Afghan refugees, a very good host. There are provisions, legal provisions, religious provisions, also giving access to education that, that are very progressive. But uh, we do recognize the, ex the, the complexity and the difficulties of the situation. And this uh, certainly, if it is not resolved one way or the other, it will have impact also on the refugees. Very often refugees work in construction work, in, in areas that are more hit by uh, uh, economic decline, and therefore they, ch they lose livelihoods. And then the risk is, of course, that there are further movements to other countries, which uh, we need to try and avoid to the extent possible if we can bring more assistance to Iran. There is not much I can do as a humanitarian organization. What we can do is continue to work with the authorities to try and support as much as we can the Afghan refugees, millions of them, that are still present in the country. I think our last, last one. mentioned that uh, every uh, every crisis needs attention that not only Ukraine uh, and uh, sometimes it seems that uh, many other nations at in distress uh, sort of blame Ukraine <laughs> in taking all of the attention uh, can you, and sometimes they say even that we are getting most of attention because we are white can you please uh, tell your opinion about these allegations and whether Ukraine should be blamed for taking the attention of course, Ukraine should not be blamed for a crisis that it is actually suffering from. <laughs> so I would be, it would be completely irresponsible for me to say something like that. But uh, uh, it is also true, you know, th this is not a new phenomenon. When you have a big new crisis, attention tends to move there. It's almost a law of communication, of international relations. And of course, Ukraine being such a big crisis, and the needs being so huge. I mean, I've been several times there. I've seen it myself. This is not just made up. You know, people need everything 
that they have lost through this uh, destruction and, and the war. So inevitably, this means that there is less attention. My role is to remind everybody that, yes, we need to continue and even step up what you do, we do for Ukrainian refugees, displaced, and for Ukrainians in general, but not at the expense of what we do in other countries. And you know, this is a problem on the financial side because uh, clearly uh, the, the needs are so big and so urgent that there is a tendency to prioritize that, and I think that it is important not to forget the rest. We have, there was a question that I didn't answer, but I used this to answer. I said it at the Council, UNHCR has a financial gap, a shortfall of about $700 million between now and the end of the year. The end of the year is next month. So this, and I have not seen this in my time at the, at the helm of UNHCR. But it is not in the Ukraine response. The gap is in the Middle East for Syrian refugees. It is in Africa in many situations. I don't think it's a, it's, a, it's a cultural choice. I think it is simply an imbalance that needs to be corrected. Otherwise, we will have to make cuts in refugee assistance in many places that are in desperate need of that assistance. Thank you very much. Thank you all. No. Can you comment on the migrants being bused from Texas to New York? Thank you.